All right, might as well get going. Um, so let's see, there's like a couple things going on right now. First thing, we have to grade your homework five. Now you guys are actually going to be part of that. I think I might have mentioned it in class, but here's how it's going to go. Over the next few days, uh, you should be getting an email from your lab TA probably saying, here's where you sign up. And you'll go onto this uh, form, probably a spreadsheet or something like that. And uh, you'll sign up for a time. And then you'll meet with two TAs, who or me, depending on if I'm your lab leader or whatever. And during that little 20 minute meeting, you'll talk about your sorts and the results of the thousands of tests we ran on your sorts uh, over this weekend. I ran like thousands and thousands of tests. And you'll talk about the asymptotic complexity of your sorts. You'll talk about the algorithms you decided to use. Uh, maybe you'll walk through the actual sorts themselves. And the coolest part about it is you'll actually see the data and the times that it took for all of your sorts to complete. And then based on that data, you can answer some questions about, hey, what happens if we had, instead of 10,000 elements, 100,000 elements? Or instead of 100,000, a million? How much time would it take? And what does this show you about the asymptotic complexity? So I think from that standpoint, it'll be kind of interesting. Uh, it's not a particularly like stressful thing. You don't have to get stressed out about it. But re review the sorts that you did, and review the uh, and review like the asymptotic complexity for all your sorts, and and uh, you should be good to go. As far as the time frame for getting it done, we're going to shoot for like this week and next week. So there's going to be a bit of a window there before uh, before we get them all done. All right, questions on that. All right, we've also got homework six out. Hopefully you got my email about that. I will talk about that a little bit more today, answer any generic questions you have. I'll show you my, as it turns out, flawed solution. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the tester that you use will pick out like various uh, solutions, and it'll show you how yours works. And mine seems to forget about QU in some cases. So that's the way it goes. Uh, but I'll show you that. And then. We will talk about, uh, we'll do one more hash table example. So for those of you who are still like, I'm not quite sure I get hash tables yet, uh, then we'll be able to practice that. You'll get that under your belt. And then we'll go on to graphs, which is another huge, huge topic in computer science. You will see this for the rest of your time in computer science classes. You'll see graphs. They model a ton of different things in the world. And we will talk about some of the ones they do and some of the interesting features about graphs and some of the things you can do with them. All right. So questions before we get going. All right. Final assignment, Boggle. Actually, before we even do the final assignment, uh, last week I got some emails and some people talked to me about the cryptographic hashing stuff we talked about. Uh, some people said, hey, we want more of that. It was kind of cool. And I agree. Some of that is definitely cool. Would anybody be interested in if I held like another session sometimes after, like, it'd be outside of class in the evening someday, uh, where we just talked about um, cryptography and some, some of this public private key stuff? Would you be interested in that sort of thing? Some people raise your hands if you are. Yeah, that'd be cool. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll come up with a little, maybe I'll, I'll tape it. So if you can't go, whatever, we'll do that. And uh, yeah, we'll have something like that where we can do a little bit more of that. It doesn't, it doesn't really fit into the, into the data structures like in particular, so I don't want to go too deep in the class. But after class, I'm happy to talk about it as much as you want. All right. Now, Boggle. Here's the deal with Boggle. Uh, to do April 22nd, unfortunately, because we have to grade them, I can't, I can't let you have extensions past the 24th. So please shoot for the 22nd. If for some reason something comes up, um, I'll almost certainly give you an extension. But past the 24th, I just got to collect it and say, sorry. OK, so shoot for the 22nd to get this thing done. You have to write three programs for this, for this uh, assignment. Now, we went over this the other day. Remember, a boggle board, actually, if you go to YouTube and you look up like boggle videos, there's this some company that I don't exactly know what their deal is, but they have these little like short 30 second videos on how to play boggle. And it's, it's, they're, they're kind of amusing. Um, I actually watched, there, there's, there's a game show about boggle, like in the 80s, I think. There was one also in Germany. Anybody speak German? Yeah, so the words in German can get like, like 40, 50 letters long really easily. And it was really funny watching this little clip on like German boggle. I mean, I, don't, I haven't spoken German in years. I took a couple of years in, college, in high school. But like some of these words, like they, they'll pick up these words and they'll just scatter like all across the board to find these. It's pretty amusing. But anyway, 
So Boggle has a grid of either 4 or 5 by 4 or 5, depending on how you do it. Your program should be able to handle pretty much any size grid. Okay? And they can have uh, various letters in them. Let's see, uh, I don't know, L, R, O, P, etc. Another L, M. And actually, if the, if the boggle board itself was, what it is is it's this little, there's the dice, and you shake them all up, and the letters can end up like sideways and so forth, right? So um, they're all, I guess I should fill in the rest here, right? Uh, Q, U ends up as being one letter, one tile, and then um, another R, let's say. So anyway, that's what we're gonna. That's what we have to work with, okay? You guys have to come up with three programs for this. You have to come up with the solver. The solver says find every word that can be found in this boggle board according to a dictionary that we give you of words, like a list of words, okay? So we give you a list of words, and then you're gonna end up using that list to find every single word that appears in here, even if it appears multiple times. And uh, what do I mean by appears? Well, you can go up, down, left, right, or at any diagonal such that things <clears throat> touch. OK, so let's see. Um, ball, B-A-L-L -L is a word in this, right? What you can't be B-A-R is another one, three letters or more. What you can't do in this is you can't go, uh, let's see, let's see if I can find one. You can't skip a letter even though three letters are contained. They have to be in order, right? Um, I didn't pick a very good, um, <laughs> let's see, uh, I don't know, mm, car, is that one? Well, no, see, if, here, this, like this car, C-A-R, those are connected, but they aren't in order. So this car, C-A-R, is not a word. Well, this, this there is no other car. I, think. But crab. what's that? Crab. Which crab? C A B. C R A B. Oh, C R A B. C R A B is a word. Yeah, so there's lots of words in there. Yeah. Can you, double that? you cannot use the same letter twice. Okay? By the way, the instructions are online. You can go look at the instructions. We're going to follow the instructions as best we can for the for the scoring of this. Question? Uh, it does not wrap around. No, D is not next to X. That would be kind of weird, but that's, that'd be a cool way to play it. But no, they've got to connect in the actual board themselves, board itself. Okay, So you can't reuse the letters, and you can go any direction like that. The any direction thing, it's actually relatively easy to do recursively. You can do it however you want. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. right? You can figure that out on your own, um, but you can do it any way you want. It is, there is a recursive solution to this, uh, but you can also do it using uh, regular iter iterative ways as well. Okay, uh, We've got the solver, which is, gives you all the words. The checker says, here's a bunch of possible words. Number one, are they on the board? And number two, are they in the dictionary? Okay, So there's two things you kind of have to check. It's a completely separate program, though. So if you wanted to, and I'm not suggesting this, but if you wanted to, solve the board and then do the ch then check the words against all the solved words, you probably could, but they're two different programs and you can't really call one program from the other. So you have to include that you would have to include the solver in your checker, which I I guess that's that's allowed, but possibly not the most efficient way to do it. Okay? And then the scorer <clears throat> will actually take the list of words that are provided and then determine whether or not they are uh, a pro they are Determine whether or not, uh, and they've already been checked, by the way. So then determine what the score is for each. Like you get one point for a three or four letter word. You get two points for a five letter word, like five points for a six letter word, or something like that. OK? Questions on that so far? Rules or anything? <clears throat> OK. Scoring, boggle rules. Uh, we will make sure that that's uh, set out so that it works properly. We will provide you a dictionary. So the last time this project was given, it was a few years ago, uh, the, you had to, they, the students had to build their own try for the class uh, before as a previous project. We did it as a lab. So I'm not going to make you guys go and build a whole other try. You are perfectly welcome to. Right? If you want to go and, and build your own try or come up with some other 
way to store words in a dictionary form. That is completely up to you. But for those who don't, I've already given you the dictionary class. You, know how, you have to know how to use it, but for what it's worth, it's uh, given to you. So that'll make things a little bit easier if, for those who don't want to write your own. You do have to do your own tests. Uh, you can test via the website. Now let me show you what the website looks like. This is actually really neat. You guys know Bruce Millay. Uh, Bruce is, I love Bruce, and he came up with this website. And let's see if we, there it is. Uh, what it is is you go to your, uh, you go to your public website and it will uh, bring up this, this uh, board like this. And what you do is you click on either the 4x4 four four or the 5x5 five five, and it does a little board like that. And Bruce is clever enough to have it so it even rotates the letters wrong, which is kind of, kind of clever. Uh, but what he does is he said he, he doesn't want to make it necessarily that hard, so you can click the little vertical and it will like boop, make them back so they actually are right side up. Turns out the, the rules of Boggle say you're not allowed to touch the board when the timer's going. It's like really official, I guess. Um, but anyway, you can do that. Uh, you can also shake it up if you want. Uh, let's see. If we shake it up, I don't know if it'll change the, it actually, let's see. No, it doesn't change the timer here, right? It does go back to not being vertical. But so, so you've got a little timer that counts down. And what you can do is you can find some words in here. Like hog is a word that I see. Um, A-D-D -D is a word. Can anybody find a four-letter word? Short. Short. There's a five-letter word, right? S-H-O-R-T. S-H-O-R-T. There's also sort is another Oops. Sort is another one. Which one? Go, ghost. Wow, that's pretty good. OK, so let me find some words that aren't in there, like RDGT is not in there, right? That one doesn't count. Uh, let's say um, dog is there, but let's say, uh, let's say we thought it could be, um, uh, let's see, got is a word. There's a lot of them in this one. So you thought it could be bog, yeah, B O G, right? So we'll put that in there. And what it, what it, what's done is the timer will eventually go out. You can, if you think you found all the words, you can click to stop it. And then you just click solve, right? Solving should not take that long for this dictionary, right? Shouldn't take that long. And it, um, it solves it. And then hopefully all these words are on here. Let's see if we can find ghost. Uh, did I already miss? G should be down at the bottom the way I did this algorithm. There it is. G H O S T. So here's the other interesting thing. When you hover over the word, it highlights the letters, which means you have to keep track of all the positions of the letters when you are putting the words into the, the final form. Right? There is a data structure that has that set up for you. It's called bog word, I believe it is. And bog word is made up of bog letters or bog lets, which have the position of the letter in there for you. Yeah, Nathan. It's a dictionary that, um, that is, uh, it's, I think it's the Unix dictionary is what it is. Um, and it's, it's something like 170,000 words or something. So most of these are in here. I don't know what G-O-S-H-T means, but it's in the dictionary. You should not care about what's actually in the dictionary, but that's, uh, that's there. Okay. So again, when you highlight a word, it will tell you where it is, right? So G-O-R-I-S is there, drat is D-R-A-T there, et cetera. If there are words that happen twice, it's because they f happen two times in the list. And the, this list should have all the ones that happen, even the duplicates, because it's solving the entire board. Okay? The other list, this is when you actually do the check on it. When you do the check, it runs the checker and the scorer. And it should tell you, and there's a bug here too, it should tell you which words are OK and how many points they get. And then like RDGT was a word in here, sure, but it was not a word that was in the dictionary. So you got to check both of those. And uh, let's see, bog was not a word in here. Uh, and then in this case, it should say eight words because I, I counted, or seven words. It should only count the ones that count, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And it should give you your total score. Okay, so you see how that works? That's how the tester works. And once you write your code, you can test it here. It might be a good idea to figure out a test plan on your own to do much smaller dictionaries and, and, uh, and, and tests like that. When I was writing mine, I had little tiny dictionaries. I would like uh, maybe three words or something just to test. Okay, let's see. So that's that cues. Let's talk about cues. Let's see if we can find a cue in here. Let's see, five by five, no cues, no cues. I think Bruce also added so it does the appropriate letters. There it is. There's a Q. OK, so let's see. Q, U, what kind of word? Quest is not in there. Q, U, I don't 
think the S, we could try it, but by the way, this is part that's broken on mine. Q U E S T. That doesn't quite work. Uh, Query? Queer. Queer. Q U E E R is in there? Q U E E R. That'll work. OK. Um, oh, it's in there twice, actually. R E A L, et cetera. So anyway, you, you, can, you can see how this works. What's supposed to happen when you hit, you hit stop and then solve. Oops, did it not stop? Oh, there you go. Stop, solve. Even the 5 by 5 should be quick, right? Let's see if the Qs are in there. The Qs are represented here. So there's lots that we missed, right? Queer, 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 queer. Queer's in there a bunch of times. Key, uh, key is in there, quad, quads, query, whatever. Anyway, they're all in there. Um, my checker's broken. I believe it won't pick up on the Qs yet. Yeah, it says no. So I got to fix that. Um, but, uh, but anyway, you can also see how do you keep these, like what's the form that the website has? Let me show you. You can click on this little period right down there, and it will actually show you. Let me b boost this up in size. It says a couple things. It tells you the, the seed. That's the random number generator seed. I will have to figure out how you can plug that in if you want to use the same one over and over again. It's, I think it's possible. I just don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how. Um, but here's all the solutions. The solutions are going to be uh, A, R, E, according to this is solution. A is at position 0, 0, R is at position 0, 1, and E is at position 0, 2. Okay? This is called the, uh, what is it called, the Hescott normal form or something like that, after Professor Hescott who came up with this assignment. And uh, those, it lists all those in there. Q's in this form are, whoops, are represented with an actual Q U. Whereas in the internal data structure, they're only represented as a Q. So you've got to be a little careful when translating back and forth. But you'll have, you'll have plenty of time to like debug this stuff. Okay, but this is the form. It starts with an angle bracket and then space and then like R O space one, uh, sorry, R space zero space one space E, et cetera. Okay? You see how that works? All right, what other questions do you have about Boggle? This is not a trivial assignment, by the way, so you really do have to start it like soon if you haven't yet. Do you know? I think in real Boggle, there's probably only one QU. It's probably, I think Bruce did it right. I think Bruce probably said these are the letters and figured it all out. For all I know, he might have the, the letters might be exactly the way they are. He probably, knowing him, he probably took a Boggle set and like figured out which letters are where and like did all that. So knowing him, the QU is on the other side of whatever. Yeah? Just to confirm the rules, um, any tile within like the box around it, so any diagonal or touching tile is playable? Any touching tile is playable, yeah, including diagonals. Including the corners, yeah. But like M is only touching R, L, and E. Can't use the same tile twice in a single word. In, any, in multiple words, you can use them as many times as you want. But in, in one word, you can't use a single tile twice. Yeah, good. Nathan, you had a question? This user interface is built for you. So this is all built for you. You guys will have this available. It's already available. Um, what you have to do is you have to, you have to take the uh, board input, which is a, like a 4x4 four four grid or a 5x5 five five grid, and then produce all the solutions. Then you have to take a list of the words that a user types in and say whether or not they are in the board and what the point value is for them. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Are the board dimensions passed to us? The board dimensions are passed to you. Uh, a couple things. I put this in the Piazza post. For whatever reason, this is the way Bruce did it, and I didn't want to change it for our assignment. The dictionary of words that you get, the last line that you get will be a period by itself. That's What's that? It, it's a sen sentinel, yes. The words that you get over here do not have that sentinel. So you have to figure out. I, I wrote in, I kind of said in the Piazza Post how to do the, deal with it. But it's, a lot, it's odd that it's different. But that's the way Bruce did it. So I'm not sure why. But it's, it's not hard to do. And if anybody has trouble with the input part, I'd be happy to help you out with that. It's not, it should not be the hard part. Anybody else? OK, I hope you guys have fun with this. It should be a fun assignment. I enjoyed like, doing it. Uh, but I said, as I said, it's not trivial. If you do find it easy, that's awesome, right? You should be smug and be happy about that, right? But I also put in that giant like nine-page document that that you have to read about it. I put a bunch of like above and beyond things. You can build your own dictionary. You can uh, 
You can um, not use vectors. You can use uh, just dynamic arrays, right? You can make it. Uh, you can make it so that two players can play it, or something crazy like that, right? You could do that. Uh, I said one. I said you could make a poem out of all the words that it, that are in the Baga board. You know. So anyway, you should not. There should be no complaints about it being too easy, <laughs> because you could always go above and beyond. All right, but it it it's definitely challenging. Okay. All right. Let us move on. Let's do an example of hash table practice. Here's what we're going to do. This requires a pencil, pa piece of paper, and a pencil or pen. We are going to start with a hash table with a capacity of three elements. We're going to take the following hash function. 5 plus 2x mod the capacity. This part is generally considered the compression, but we're going to call this whole thing the hash function. The collision type we're going to use is linear. You are going to hash the following six numbers into the table. If it only holds three things, you're going to have to expand. Okay? And then because mo uh, doing modulus is not something that we do in second grade like all the other arithmetic operations, I have produced a little hash table for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start writing. I'm going to write the details up over here. Okay? You're going to start with a bore, a three by or a, a three element vector. Okay? You're going to the hash function is going to be 5 plus 2x mod the capacity. All right? And then we're going to we're going to hash 8 3 9 15 22 and 11 and we're going to try to figure out what the final table is, okay? So here's what I'll do. I'll put up the mod table for you so that you can see that. Hopefully you can read that. There you go. And this is just x and then mod 3 and mod 6, because you need both. Okay? I will start doing the answer up here, and you guys should uh, race me. And you can work with your partner, too. Yeah? When we double, are we copying over or are we being switched? You tell me. I want to be able to find whatever value is in there at the end.
think that's right. Eleven mod five. What's the new capacity? What's the new capacity? What was your question? Yeah. Forty nine mod six is one, which came from so was already something in one, right? Oh, was there not something in two? Did I screw that up? Hang on. Maybe I, went, maybe I went out of order. So let's see. If we're going, we just did 15. So if we do 22, that's 49 mod 6 is 1. You're, uh, is one. So you're right. I did get it out of order. So that's, whoops, 22, right? 22 and then 11. Yeah. Thank you. Good call. OK, how are you guys doing on this? Good? We get this now? Like, are we going to get how to do this? Yeah, Josh. Uh, why is the initial the 9 in the 1 slot? Why is the 9 in the 1 slot? OK, so first we put 8 in, and it had to go in the 0 slot. Yeah. And then we put 3 in, and it went in the 2 slot. And then the 9 was supposed to go where? 9 hashes to 23. 23 mod 3 is what? 2. two. So it tried to go here, it couldn't go there, it tried to go there, it couldn't go there, it has to go there. So are you doing linear? We're doing linear, yeah, I didn't tell you that. No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think we were doing? Uh, what did you think we were doing? A uh, linked list? Destructive. So what? You're not sure? I thought it was destructive. Oh, destructive, yeah. Sorry. I didn't I thought I said that. I probably I, I bet I put it on the form, but I didn't mention it. Collision type linear. Oh. Skip that line. Sorry about that. But anyway, we're doing linear, so that's how it works. Yeah. Is it more efficient to do linear over linked li or linkless over linear? Yeah. Well, good question. So first of all, um, the performance if the uh, if the load factor is lower, the performance is probably slightly better if you're not dealing with linked lists in general, because linked lists aren't the best data structure. You've never heard me say that, right? Um, but, but that's probably the, the, the one thing. Um, the second one is you do have to uh, still rehash everybody when, you're, when your load factor gets big. So you'd still have to go through all the linked lists, which would take more time. Having one data structure is nice instead of having multiple data structures. So there's, there's trade-offs, but they're, they're not too bad. Yeah, Josh. So a uh, good question. So when I rehashed this, so we saw that we, we rehashed this when it got to 3, right? Most of the time we rehash before it gets all the way full. We do it at some load factor we calculate. But in this case, then we go 8, we rehash 8, then we rehash 9, then we rehash 3, because you rehash in order of the table, basically. You don't rehash in this order, because you're probably not keeping these around, because you're already storing them in, a real, in another data structure, right? So yeah. And by the way, if you didn't know these things, that's why we're doing it. <laughs> so you can keep so that you can learn some of this stuff. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So was it necessary to draw the other? No, no, I just drew this so that you could see this is what I put in next. This is not nothing's changing from here to here. Yeah. Um, by the way, okay, so let's say we're searching for something in this table. Let's say we're searching for twenty-two. How do you find twenty-two in the table? What you don't do is you don't go, is this 22, is this 22, is this 22, right? No, what do you do? You hash the value you're looking for. 22 hash value is 49, and then? Um, and, well, mod 5 is 22. Mod 5 is 22. Mod 5 is 49. And then mod capacity, OK, so 49 mod 6 is 1. So we should look for it there. And if it's not there, if then it's, it's not there, we'd run through the next one, right? Let's try this. Let's see if we can find. Um, uh, let's see if we can find 6 in this table. 
6 times 2 is 12, plus 5 is 17. 17 mod 6 is uh, 5. So we start at 5 and we go, is that 6? No. 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 Is that? We got a little bit of a problem here, right? Until you reach the initial box. Yeah, you either have to keep track of the initial box you look in or just make sure you're expanding it before it gets full. You should never have a load factor of 1 or more. You should really have it 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, whatever around there. Okay. All right, questions on that? Sorry about the not telling you it was linear. Tonight you'll practice uh, three different types. You'll practice the linear again. You will practice double hashing. And you will practice chaining. So you'll get a little bit of practice in all that Okay, in, in the lab. All right, good job. Let us move on to, oh, there's the one. 33, 15, 22, 8, 11, 9, yeah. All right. We are now going to move on to graphs. We are talking about these guys, not this. right? Even though colloquially we say this is a graph, maybe, or a chart, or whatever, when we talk about computer science graphs, we're talking about the ugly stepchild of a tree. <laughs> OK? If you'll notice, this kind of looks similar to the things we've seen before. right? We have nodes in here. We have uh, little like pointers to the next one. We don't call them that, of course, because of course it's got to be different. right? We actually call these vertices and edges, which we'll get to. Was anybody in the Comp 61 discrete math class I taught a couple weeks ago? Yeah. Um, we're going to go through graphs again, but in a slightly different way. Like I don't care about a lot of the terminology that we cared about in that class. Um, we're going to go through some slightly different, different types of things. OK? So we're going to talk about graphs. Graphs are like super duper important in computer science. You see graphs all the time. Okay. In fact, most of you guys probably use a particular uh, application every single day that uses graphs like extensively. Any, uh, any ideas what those might be? What was it? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. If this, is, if this is person one, and this is person two, and this is person three, you can see that they're all connected this way. right? And Facebook is like huge on graphs, because they have to be, because the entire structure of a social network is a graph. Right? So if you ever try to get a job at Facebook, they will ask you graph questions, no doubt. Right? They have to, because their whole business is like based on this, this graph setup. Okay? So we'll do that. Um, there are lots of other examples that we'll get to as we go along. Here's what a graph is in computer science. Okay? It's a data structure. It's pretty common, similar to a tree, in that it's nonlinear. Right? It's not like a linked list or something that's nice and linear. And it has vertices and edges, we'll call them. I should change that. They're not really called links. It has, it has nodes and links, or vertices and edges. Uh, but, with, uh, but there's no structure. I also like to call it the Wild West of the data structure world, right? Because it's like, things can kind of go anywhere, right? There's no real structure to a graph, OK? Except what's built into those edges connecting all the different vertices. OK, so it's, it's, uh, it takes a different kind of mentality, although you'll see some similarities, especially in next week's lab on graphs. You'll see some, uh, some extreme similarities between graph traversal and uh, traversing trees. Okay, Here's the simplest type of graph. We call it an undirected graph. The reason we call it undirected is because if you'll notice in some of the other graphs, they've got arrows on them, right? arrows pointing from one uh, vertex to the next. In this case, we have no arrows on here, meaning that it's undirected, meaning that this person is connected to this person, and this person is connected to this person, and there's no difference between that connection. It's not a one-way connection. right? If we put an arrow on one of these, it would be a directed graph. And that would be like in Facebook, let's say you block somebody, and they don't block you back. So there's a way for you to send them a message, but they can't send one back to you, uh, et cetera. Right? So that's what a graph looks like. Notice, no structure. Can be the, the vertices can be all over the place. We actually call them vertices and edges. Okay, the vertices are the uh, the vertices are the kind of the nodes. The edges are the connections between them. We generally label them with letters and then maybe a number like that. V for vertice, vertex and E for edge. I will screw up every so often and call them nodes. Sorry, you can correct me if you want. But we call them vertices when we're talking about graphs. Okay, we've got these uh, things like this. Turns out that it doesn't matter where the actual edges lie. There's no structure that matters in the big picture, right? 
Um, it might matter in real life if you're talking about like, let's say your Google Maps, and these are all different cities or something. Sure, the location of them matters, but not to the graph. Like the graph is just going to be, you can put the numbers in any, you know, any kind of place you want, but the, the, the graph itself. These two happen to be the same exact graph. What do we call that in Comp61? There we go. What was it? Isomorphic. I'm not going to test you on that word. But isomorphic means that these two are exactly the same graph, just shifted around. In fact, graphs can be isomorphic without labeling them the same letters. Like this V0 happens to be the same as this. I could, enable, I could have labeled this Bob and this you know, Jerry or something, and it doesn't matter. Right? It's the, it's the connections that between them. For every, no, every vertex here, you can, find the other, you can find a vertex that's connected to it twice, and then so on and so forth, so that all the connections are the same. OK, that's an isomorphic graph. So it doesn't actually matter. Placement's irrelevant. Which means that sometimes you can hopefully come up with a better placement than you, can, you, you get to decide what the placement is when you're drawing these. Okay? All right, we're going to do that in a second, too. Here's a little demonstration on uh, how to use a graph to represent a situation. There's a game, we'll call it the coin game. Right? Called the coin game. Here's how it works. You have three coins. Anybody from a country that only has dollar coins or, and not, not, uh, Ameri uh, not uh, dollar bills? Yeah, yeah, there you go. I think that's what we should do. I think we should kind of, I like George Washington and all, but he's on the dollar coin too, so we'll give him a coin. Kind of like pennies. We shouldn't even have pennies. But mm, anyway. So here's how the coin game works. We start out with three coins. One is in the head's position, one is in the tail, the middle one's in the tail's position, the end one is the head's position. And your goal is to go from that starting position to this position, heads or tails, heads, tails. Okay? So in this situation, we're going to do that, and you have to do it by following some rules. There's only two rules, they're not that hard. You can flip the middle coin at any time. That's rule number one. Rule number two, you may flip an end coin only if the other two coins are the same. Okay, So in this case, the only thing we can do is flip the middle coin, because you can't flip an end coin because the other two coins aren't the same. You get that? That's how the rules work. Somebody asked this earlier, which is I think it turns out to be a very good question. When we say flip, we don't mean like flinging it up in the air and it lands however it lands. We mean like just flipping it over. If we did mean flinging it up in the air and it lands like it could land in the same position, that would be a slightly different graph. And I'll show you that graph as well. Uh, I won't write it on the overhead, but it's, it's interesting. To, there is a difference in that sense. But for our purposes, all we care about is flip means you take one of them and you change its orientation. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. Okay? We can use a graph to solve the game. Okay? We can construct an undirected state graph. In other words, a state is a three coin situation. So this is one state, heads, heads, heads. Another state is tails, tails, tails. And there's other states as well. And you can figure out which states are which uh, as you go through this. Okay? Here's how you might want to do it. All right, I'll start you out with this. What you can do is you can do this. You can say, here's a state, and we're going to call it the original state, which was heads, tails, heads. And there's some other state, let's say this one, which is one we want to get to. My ovals are not particularly good, but anyway, tails, heads, tails. All the other states should be represented, and edges should be between uh, the actual states that you're allowed to go to uh, from each individual state. So try that on your own. Take about three or four minutes and try that, and we'll see how you guys get. I'll start doing it up here, too. Okay. I will go back to the rules. Oh, you got to do it in your head. You want to do it on the board? If you want to, you can. You don't have to. You, want, you don't want to? All right, try. Kate has agreed to do the, try to do this on the board, so no fair if she screws up. When I screw up, you can laugh at me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Did 
to get it already? Did you connect them all? You got to connect them all with you got to connect them all with the right edges. Don't forget to connect them with edges. You tell me. You follow the rules and the and the rules state which edges you can which ones you which states you can go to. Right? Remember you can only go from certain states to certain other states. Hey, you get it? Oh, let me see. Okay, let's see. So this is where you started? Mm -hmm. There. Okay, good. That's the only way to go. And then here you can go from there to there or there to there. Awesome. Because you can flip either that one or that one. Mm -hmm. Good. And then from here to there. Ah, oh, looks great. Thanks. Yeah, looks good. All right. All right, Kate, I can't wait to see you connect all these. <laughs> First of all, did she get all the states? Yeah, awesome. Oh, it looks good. That's great. Good, good, good. How'd you guys do? That's one solution. Is it all the solutions? You can find all of them. You can find all of them. Good. I like what you got. It's one solution. There might be more. These are undirected. Yep, undirected graph because there's no arrows. Because you can always go. Be, you can always go between two states back and forth, right? Uh, let's look at the, we'll look at it and see if they're reversible. But you can probably figure it out, but you can, you can use the rules and see if it works out. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, lie, don't let the streams cross. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Are they really making another Ghostbusters? Hmm. The original is pretty good. All right. Where's the beginning and where's the end? Here's the beginning and here's the end, right? That looks pretty good. <laughs> so by the way, and, and Kate is realizing this right now, organization in doing some of these graphs is super important because sometimes you can like you, you don't necessarily know all your situation. Although I like yours is looking pretty pretty good, all things considered. I like that it has ears. I think you got it pretty well. I think that's it. All right. So very good. Let's give Kate a round of applause. That was really good up there, right? So, so here's 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 what she did. So so this is the this is a, an interesting looking graph, in the sense that you can do it. But let's let's see if we can make do this, go from one to the other. We are trying to start here and make it to here. I'll put little asterisks on here. Trying to go from here to here. OK, so can you either, let's see. Can you change the middle one to go here? Yes. Can you change the, the right one to go here? No. You're not allowed to in this case, right? So this one I don't think is allowed. OK, that's all right. OK, can, once you're here, can you either change the left T, like this one, flip this one, or flip this one? Which is true. And she's got two things here, so you can do that. If you're, let's say we go this way, from here, what's the only thing you can do? You, well, there's actually two things you can do. You could flip this one back. You could flip it back and go back up here, but we're trying to go in the right direction. So let's flip this one, right? Or sorry, flip the middle one. OK, flip the middle one, and that will take you to here, tails, tails, heads. And then from here, you could either go back to that one, or you could flip the right one, because these two are the same. So we'd go to tails, tails, tails. And then from here, if you flip the middle one again, you get to the solution. right? What if you flip the end one again? Or let's see, what if you flipped one of the end ones again? You could go here, and then you could keep going, and keep going, and keep going if you wanted to. If you were four and you were playing this game, that might be the way you'd solve it, right? Keep going for a while. Let me show you what my graph looks like. I think it's a little bit easier to understand. 
uh, in the picture. Basically, you're going to go up here and then branch one of two ways, right? Can, is it reversible? Yeah. You can always go back to the previous state, as it turns out, right? Which is a good reason not to have directed graphs. It definitely could go this way and just keep going around forever and never get a solution. If you get here and you forget that you can just flip the middle one, well, hmm, you must be four. But, um, but you could. You could keep going in either direction. But this is a graph, and this is how it's, um, how it's representing for this game. It represents all the possible states. There you go. OK? Questions on that game? All right. Let us move on. There, we already talked about the states you can go. So if we don't have, or if we have arrows on the end of our uh, edges, we can call this a directed graph. Okay, this is the one where one, one vertex can, do, can get to the other, but the other can't get back if you're going to go from one to the other. If you were traversing this, you would go here, can't go the other way. Okay? That's a directed graph. Graphs can also have other properties that we're not going to care too much about in this class. Graphs can have loops, which means they go back. And by the way, loops is what could happen if you had to flip the coin and it landed however it landed. Right? Let's say we had this again. If you flip the heads and it lands heads, you stay in the same state. What we, what we would do there is we would put a little arrow around that state. We do that for all of them, actually. You'd have to do that at every single one. Okay, that would be a loop. And we're going to see some with loops as well. Graphs can also have multiple edges. Okay, multiple edges just mean two lines going in the same direction. We would rarely see this. It doesn't seem that it's not that necessary. Okay, if you were so, by the way. Another, I kind of hinted at this earlier. Another use for graphs, a really a one that you probably use all the time, in fact, I use it so much I can't imagine how I did without it, is, did you know your phone will do this? Take me home. Getting directions to home. All right. Oh, oh, now you're going to know where I live. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Um, you can know where I live if you want. Um, I live on the other side of campus. But what it's going to do, it pulled up the Maps application, and it's about to take me to my house, right? And mapping applications use graphs all the time, because these could be individual cities, whatever. I was thinking, what's a use for double arrows in one direction, maybe? I was thinking lanes in the road. If you had a four-lane highway versus a two-lane highway or something like that, maybe you could have extra lanes. I don't know. It's not the most, not the, not the best example, but but gra mapping applications use graphs all the time. Okay, and they use use a lot of these things. I'm not sure what would happen if you said, "Take me home," and you were home, <laughs> right? It might. Oop, I don't know. Google would probably take me outside to my porch and then say, "Go back inside," and then it would laugh. Some engineer would laugh at me. Um, but anyway, so that's another couple things we can talk about. How do we represent graphs, like in the computer, right? With with trees and with linear with linked lists and with arrays, we always knew it was a pretty simple like either node-based tree or a simple structure. It's a little bit trickier here. Here's one way to do it. There's a thing called the adjacency matrix. For two nodes to be adjacent to each other, it means that you can get from one to the other. Okay? In other words, one happens to be adjacent to two. Two is not adjacent to one for a directed graph like this. Because you can't go backwards from two to one. Okay? In fact, there's no way to get from two to one. Like you can't get there from here. Right? No way to get back to uh, to one from two. Anybody from Maine? Yeah, they say that a lot in Maine, don't they? You can't get there from here. It's like a, it's a Maine thing. I'm right about it. Yeah, I've heard that before. Okay. So it's quaint is what it is. It's quaint. Um, so anyway, so in this graph, what we could do is we could store this in what we call an adjacency matrix, and it's just a two-dimensional like spreadsheet basically or table. And what it says is you have false anywhere you can't that's not that's not an adjacency, and you have a true that it is, and it's from the vertical to the horizontal. So is one adjacent to two? Yes, so that's true. Is two adjacent to one? No, so it's false in that one right there. Okay. Let's see. Six. Is six adjacent to anybody? Not really, right? Six is not adjacent to anybody because you can't get to anybody from six. You can't get to any of the other vertices. So technically, six is not adjacent. Now, everybody seems to be going towards six, but notice all the falses over here. This is a good way to store this if you care about speed of looking up if two nodes are adjacent to each other. 
constant time lookup, right? If you want to know if 5 is adjacent to 4, you go to 5, you go to 4, and you go boop, it is, right? So it's a constant time lookup compared to the number of nodes in there. Josh. Hang on. Uh, what if you wanted to see if 5 was in the, you can't do it from this one. It's good, well, you can. You can say, is it one of these? I guess that's how you would do it, but, but that's the only other way. Other Josh? I'm good. Oh, you're good. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> uh, OK, so this, what's, what, so it's good that it's constant lookup. What's the bad thing about this graph? Yeah, Alex? It takes up a lot of memory. It's huge, right? It's n squared in size. Right, and it's n squared because you've got uh, you've got both you know you've got a two-dimensional array here of sides. And notice something else: the proportion of trues in here is really small because most graphs are not uh, connected in that many different ways. Right, they're connected and they can be connected in a lot of ways, but this is not a particularly efficient way of storing it from a size perspective, for what it's worth. Another way to do it would be to just say have an adjacency list. Adjacency list says, fine, write down the, no, the vertices and tell me who they are adjacent to. So 1 is adjacent to 2, 3, and 4. Notice 2, 3, and 4. 2 is adjacent to 4, 5, etc. 6, empty. 4, 6, not adjacent to anybody. Although everybody's going towards it, so who knows. Much more compact. Very compact, in fact. You have no, no, even, no worries about the, uh, the empty spaces or empty uh, links at all, edges at all. Uh, but the time to look up is constant or is linear because you might have to traverse all the way down some list, right? Either whether it's a linked list or a or a dynamic array or whatever. Okay, so a better, a different way of storing it. You can do whichever one you want depending on your situation. But if you start getting into huge graphs, the adjacency matrix just isn't going to cut it. Too big, space is too big. Uh, you could store these, by the way, as a hash uh, table where you have the keys are the vertices and the E's are just the list of edges. The elements are just the list of the edges. Or a list, sorry, list of the adjacent vertices. Okay. So it turns out we can represent graphs with weighted paths as well. And by the way, a path is a uh, a way of getting from one vertex to the other vertex. Okay? What we can do is we can say, it's not just, hey, you're adjacent to you, you. It's how much does it cost or how much does it weigh to get from one to the next? What's a good application that might use this? What's that? Wait, ways? What are, Oh, traffic, yeah, traffic apps are great. Like total traffic apps, right? Google, when they tell you to go from here to, uh, I don't know, anybody ever tried to drive from like here to Jamaica Plain? Almost impossible, right? It's a pain. Are you live out there? No? Oh, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to get there from here. Um, and, and what Google sometimes will do is actually put you on 93 and route you all the way around the city and then back into Jamaica Plain instead of going side street to side street to side street. But it totally depends. And what does it depend on? Depends on traffic, depends on speed limits, right? The highway generally is more. Depends on the, the time of day and whatever. Uh, it can also depend on how many left turns you have to take. Do you know that UPS actually tries to avoid all left turns in their trucks? It's because left turns are more expensive because they have to wait for traffic, right? Unless you're in England, it's the other way around, I guess. But, um, but, uh, but yeah. So you have to. They they purposely do that. I always wonder if they have to replace some tires before the others, though. <laughs> I don't know. But, but anyway, you can do this. So the edges here just say, how much does it cost to get from one place to the other? So you can traverse this. And what you want to do, if you're trying to find out the cost of an entire path, is you try to go from one vertex to the other, and you, count, and you add up the path. So to get from v1 to, say, v5, one path is 2 and 10, which would be a path length of 12. So the v1 to v2 to v5 is a path length of the weighted path length is 12. Okay, So that's the, the weighted ones. All right. Sometimes, actually I think these are out of order a little bit. 
No, well, we'll get, to, we'll get to the other stuff. Sometimes what we want to do, in fact, many times, is we want to find what we call the shortest path from one vertex to the other. Okay, this is super duper important for applications like maps, mapping applications, right? Because they've got all these different graphs. And, it's, and you generally don't want to say, I'd like to go to New York City. How do I get there? And it routes you through Seattle. Right? That would be bad. Right? It's because you want to find the shortest path. It might be a nice drive, but you're going to be there for, there for days instead of hours. Right? So you want to find the shortest path. And this is a super big, important uh, topic in computer science. It's also relatively well solved. There's a number of, of algorithms, and we will go through at least one of them today to do some of this. There's some really famous ones. Probably the most famous algorithm in computer science is one we'll talk about on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Question. What's the shortest path from vertex 1 to vertex 6? Go. All right, who thinks they know? Yes. Good. One, yeah. Uh, 61, 64, P1 to 4 to 7 to 6. And how much is that weighted path? How much? Is this 6? P1 to 4, which is 1 plus 2. Sorry. 1 to 4 to 7. So 1 plus. Uh, 4 is 5 plus 6. Yeah, OK. So that's a 6. Did anybody find anything less than 6? There are a lot of different ways to get there, though, right? You could have gone 1 to 4 to 6, but that would have a path weight of 9. You could have gone 1 to 4 to 3 to 5, and that would have a path of 3, 8, right? But you can definitely find, you could have gone, you know, one, you could have gone this way if you wanted to. There's lots of different paths, but to find the shortest. Now, can you tell me how you did it? What was the algorithm you used? <laughs> so you, you, let's see if we can enumerate that. You found all the paths available, and then you just figured out which one the shortest one was? Yeah. OK. That's, that's reasonable. Yeah, uh, could you put that into a program? Yeah. Oh, you're, OK. All right. <laughs> all right, good. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's one definitely, you know, there, there are definitely ways of doing that. We want to find one that's efficient and that's uh, easy to make into an algorithm for a computer, right? So the shortest unweighted path, by the way, is just v1 to v4 to v6, because it's a three jump, uh, well, two jumps, really. One jump and two jumps. That's the shortest unweighted path. But the shortest actual weighted path is the 1 to 4 to 6. Okay. Oh, did we do that wrong? Did I do that wrong? 1 to 4 to 1 to 4 to 6. I did do that wrong. Sorry. That's wrong. Good. Or is it right? Oh, yeah, you're right. Unweighted. Sorry. I, I'm reading it wrong. Yes, thank you. OK, so I guess I can, can't read today. Uh, OK, so that's, how, that's what we want to end up doing, right? Turns out some weighted graphs actually have negative weights, which means that you've got a little bit of a problem in this case if you're dealing with negative weights. A negative weight might come about, let's say, if you were dealing with making or losing money, and you put that somehow into a graph. Right? You might have, OK, on this path we lose money, on this path we gain money, whatever. And you want to still figure out the, the smallest path. Well, what if we went from v5 to v4? The shortest path could be just 1. But what if we went 5 to 4 to 2, which is now 4, and then back to 5, right? And now it's negative 6. And then we go back to 4, what is our path? Negative 5. So we've actually gotten a shorter weighted path by going all the way around like this, right? which would probably not be a very good thing. Because then you could say, wait a minute, what if I just keep going around? <laughs> That's shorter, 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 shorter. And you're going to end up in what we call a negative cost cycle. And it's undefined shortest path. Okay? 
So there are, there are details about uh, with negative weights we have to deal with. We'll do that on Wednesday as well. We'll get to some more negative path stuff on Wednesday. Now, how do we actually figure this out? Well, here's one algorithm. You might have had a slightly different one, but here's one algorithm. And this will be um, easy to, relatively easy to actually code up. Okay? What we do is we pick a vertex that we want to start with. In this case, we're going to pick vertex 3. Okay, we're going to start with 3. And what we're going to try to do is find the shortest path to all other vertices, not just a particular one. We're going to find the shortest path to all of them. All right? What's the distance or the cost to go from V3 to V3? Zero, right? And you know that's the case, so you're going to start by doing that. You start by saying, OK, shortest path, v3 to v3 is 0. Easy. And we can now say v3 is complete in the sense of whether or not it's like there's, there's no shorter path than 0 in this case. And we're not, we're not worrying about weights at all in this case, nor are we worried about uh, negative, of course. Now, all these others are a path of 1, weight of 1. OK, what do you think we do next? If you want to find the shortest path to 1, what's the shortest path to 1 going to be? 1, because v3 goes directly to it. So what you do is you find the adjacent v vertices to the one that you just solved. Right? So v3, now we're going, to look at I, we're going to look at v3 and we're going to say, what's the next shortest path? So here we're going to mark that one as, as a weight of 1, and we're going to mark 6 as a weight of 1. Okay? Because it's the shortest path. It's the next shortest path. We can pick either one that we just came from, and now we can say, OK, what we do is we basically pick the next shortest one that we have. And all we have is zeros and ones. We've already done zero. The next shortest is one, we pick one of them. And we say, pick that one. Let's say we pick v1. If we go from v1 to v2, notice how much farther did we have to go to get from here to here? One more, so we increase it by one. Same thing for this one. We increase it by 1. Okay. All right. And then we can also pick 6. But notice 6. 6 does what? Does it have any adjacent vertices? No. So you don't actually have to change anything for 6. You can do 6, but it's already done. So now we mark both those ones as being completed. Which ones do we go to next? Actually, not five. You still want to do the ones that we haven't cut. We've, we've, we've made the weights here, but we want to go to one of these and say, deal with it. Right? So in this case, we can deal with either two or four. Right? All right. So let's say um, we can get to uh, v5 and v7 from v2. Right? Oh, no, we can't. Sorry, not five and seven. Uh, we can get from v4 to v5 and v7. I kind of drew this without the edges now. I probably should have drawn them as edges. From v4 to v5, we start at v4 and we add 1, right? And that's going to be 3 more. We start at v4 and we go to v7, or 1 more, and then that's going to be 3. v4 to v7 is going to be 1 more. We can also go v4 to v6. How much should that be if we went on this path? Should be 1 more than this one, right? But do we change it? No, because we've already got a smaller one. So we're not going to change one that we've already covered, right? Because it, we're not going to work. We're finding the shortest path here. We're not going to update the one here to go to be a longer path. That seems ridiculous. So if you've already handled it. You don't need to deal with it again, or if it's just shorter in general. Okay? Let's look at. Uh, let's see. Two. I guess two is also on here. We can do 2 by going uh, 1 more from 2, which is 3. That one's already covered, but it doesn't really matter because it's, uh, it's also a 3. And then here to here, are we going to update 4 if we're coming from 2? No, we're not going to make it bigger. Okay? And we've actually now covered the entire graph. And if you'll notice, everybody has the little shortest path, and everybody is now covered. Right? This is called a breadth first search which is similar, as it turns out, to a level order traversal in trees. It's 
Does anyone remember how we did a level order traversal? What data structure we needed to use to do the level order traversal? Yeah. We used a queue, right? I literally, yes, uh, not yesterday, I literally on Friday had a student pop in my office who, who uh, was a student a couple semesters ago. And he said, I went to an interview last week. And they asked me about graphs. And they said, how would you find a, or, or they said, how would you do a breadth first search? And he said, I thought about it and I said, I'd use a queue. And they said, you're hired. Well, they didn't really say you're hired, but they said, that's awesome. And they were really like, happy that he knew that. right? So I'm telling you, you will get asked data structures questions in these technical interviews. OK? Q is used for that. How do we actually represent this one in the computer? Like, How do we represent how this is happening? Well, one way to do it is to come up with a little table here, basically. Or you could have this, some other struct or whatever. But basically, the, the, the way we do it is we say, start with the vertex that we're at, or that we want to start with, and mark that as having a path length of 0. Right? That's so far so good. We know that that's, that's going to have a path length of 0. We say that none of these are actually what we call known yet. They're not complete yet, okay? because we're going to have to figure that out in a little bit. The rest we mark as having an infinite, for the time being, path length. How do we represent infinite in the computer for integers? We did this in uh, the tree assignment. You guys remember how we did that? Int max. Yeah, there's a maximum value. You just mark this as the maximum value. right? So it's the maximum value. And you start out, and you do exactly the, the way it goes. You process the vertices okay, one at a time, and you go through it. So let me skip the next slide here, and then show you the actual example. Okay, Here's how it works. This is the same exact thing. We're going to start at 3. And then we're going to go find all of the uh, vertices. Right? Start at 3, and we mark it. We mark the path as 0, and then we find the ones that are adjacent to it, and we give them a length of 1. Okay? So 6 and 1 had a length of 1. And now we mark 3 as being completed. We say it's done. Don't look at it again. Okay? Next, we look at the ones that we haven't completed yet, and we find one that's got the least distance, the least path. We can pick two choices now. We can go to 1 or 6. And we, we just find the, let's say, 1. And we do the same thing. We say 1 is adjacent to 2 and 4. So we then update 2, and we update 4. And we do the same thing with 6, but it doesn't matter because 6 doesn't actually change. So that's going to happen kind of next. right? 6 is going to have no adjacent vertices. Then we do the same thing with uh, with one of the other ones, we'll pick, we'll pick uh, 2. right? So we take a look at 2, and 2 is adjacent to 4 and 5. But we don't need to update the 4 one, because we already did. It's, it's, the low, it's lower already. It's not going to be 3. And 5 gets updated. Then we pick 4. And 4, we set 5 uh, doesn't need to be changed. And then 7 does need to be changed. right? And then we still need to check the other ones, because we're not sure if they're done yet. We just check 5 and 7. Nothing needs to be updated, and we're done. Okay? You will see more examples of this sort of pattern as we go along. Okay? Let me go back and show you the actual algorithm for this. It's right here. You don't have to memorize this. Basically, you're going to initialize everything, and then you're going to set the distance to uh, 0 for the first one, right? And then you're going to go through all of the, uh, you're going to go through all of the uh, distances, right? And you're going to then go through all the vertice, vertices, and you're going to check them and see if they are adjacent or not. And then you're going to set them and keep going. Notice something about this. How many loops do we have here? Four and well, let's take the inner the this the inner ones. Four and four, or a four here and a four here. That is an n squared algorithm, right? This actually uh, is n is v squared number of vertices uh, algorithm. It's not so good as it turns out. Okay, it's not so good. If you had a graph that looked like this, which is possible, totally could look like this, this would be an n squared. Uh, or v squared algorithm, and we don't like that. Okay? We don't like that at all. So 
can we do better? Guess what? We can. <laughs> of course we can, right? Remember we said this is like level order traversal. What we can do is we can place the, the vertices in a queue when we get to them. And then only vertices that haven't been processed yet that are reachable from the next vertex we actually cover. And then if you do that, instead of doing kind of every one each time, you will actually uh, be able to process. So the current, we're going to process vertex v4. We only in queue v5, 7 and 5 because 3 and 6 are already known. So you don't have to redo all these. You don't have to keep going to every one and visit them. All right? Turns out that, that because of the breadth first search, it looks exactly, almost exactly, like our traversal for level order in a tree. It's almost identical. Right? Basically, you in queue the start one. While queue is not empty, you dequeue it, you look at all its adjacent vertices, and then you in queue the ones that are uh, you needed to update. Right? And then that's it. So it's basically the exact same thing. Okay? All right. Let us tell you what, let's stop there for today. And any questions before we get going? All right. See you guys in lab or in next on so on Wednesday. <laughs>